Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Frank Van Schaik. I am the uh, chair of the board of directors of the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Bonjour à tout le monde. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Mi'kmaq territory, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Welcome to our annual general meeting. We are also pleased to welcome those who are joining us online. Our focus this year is innovation, working differently for a healthier future. I hope everybody had an opportunity to visit each of the posters to see examples of innovative approaches to support healthy people, healthy communities for generations. We're going to begin the meeting with a patient story. After all, our focus on innovation is not for innovation's sake. It is to create a better care experience for our patients and families and to support healthier communities. The INSPIRED program, which is the subject of the video you'll see, is a program that is doing just that. I went to bed one night as normal. Got up the next morning, I couldn't breathe. I didn't know I had it. And um, made my way to the hospital and I got inside the door, sat down in one of the chairs and the cleaner found me. I didn't even know what COPD was. And it came on that quick. Quite often patients will um, allow their symptoms to deteriorate in the hope that things will simply get better spontaneously, which of course they don't. And they don't want to be a burden on their family members. They tend to be in denial. And the likely outcome of all this is that they end up in the emergency room, probably subsequently admitted to hospital, eventually discharged maybe eight, nine, ten days later. The medical side of things has been fixed, but there's no plan in place to prevent that patient coming back into hospital again when the whole cycle repeats itself. I was in and out of the hospital a lot. Um, I find since I'm involved in this program, they're keeping me out of the hospital. Following the research that we had done and our understanding of how awful it is to live with advanced chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, we developed a program that had uh, proven to be effective in other settings and brought those components into a program that we felt we could deliver in the patient's home, which is where they wanted it to be delivered. You know, it's hard to go out and get groceries much less get myself to the doctor. So having Leslie come in and help me out and check me out, that's the greatest thing ever. We are an interdisciplinary team, which means we have uh, respiratory therapists, uh, advanced care planner, social worker, myself, I'm a nurse practitioner, uh, and we work with people in their homes to provide healthcare, education, support to the patients and their families. They've always got useful information for me, whereas before, I couldn't get that. Often they're socially isolated because of their breathlessness and their inability to get out of their homes. Um, and majority um, who we've had uh, lately don't have a primary care provider, a family physician, or a nurse practitioner. So part of my role here in Halifax has been to take on that role in their home as well. What we wanted to do when we set up the program was simply improve the experience of living with advanced COPD and found as an added benefit uh, this enormous reduction in, in reliance on healthcare facilities. Just last week, I probably would have ended up in eMERGE again had it have not been for calling us. For every dollar invested, in Inspire, there's a cost aversion or a cost saving of $21, so it's hugely cost effective. It's checking all the boxes of what I believe healthcare should be and what the future of healthcare needs to look like, especially in the province of Nova Scotia. We have these types of programs um, that are extremely successful and um, provide high quality care to these individuals who really need it the most, and in addition to that, save a bunch of money. This works for me, and it works for a lot of other people like me, because this sure takes a big load off, me, off of my mind. 
I'm grateful for that. Nobody knows how grateful I am for that. Thanks to Marjorie Keeping and to the Inspired team for allowing us to share this story. It's, uh, it's so important for us to keep the voice of patience, patience are what matter, to keep the voice of patience and families at the forefront of our work. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce and welcome uh, the Honorable Randy DeLore, the Minister of Health and Wellness, to say a few words. Thank you, uh, Frank, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, before I get started, I do have to recognize uh, the members of the board uh, of the Nova Scotia Health Authority, uh, particularly those who have served since the inception of the Nova Scotia Health Authority, uh, and there are uh, four individuals uh, who served uh, and uh, uh, retired from their positions uh, within the last uh, year or so. Uh, David Dow, uh, Anna Stewart, John Young, and uh, former board chair Steve Parker. Uh, I think it's uh, important to recognize uh, the service uh, that these individuals provided along with uh, our existing uh, board members, and I really want to let them know uh, how much their service and volunteer uh, work uh, establishing the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, means to Nova Scotians. I'd also like to recognize the new members uh, who have joined the board since last year. Uh, Dr. Louise Cloutier, uh, David Graham, Dr. Patty Henson Ketchum, uh, Dr. Cindy Forbes, and of course, uh, the gentleman who was just speaking. I don't know if you've even been formally introduced at an event like this, um, but this is uh, the new chair, uh, Frank Van Schaik, uh, who's a new board member and came in to serve as chair. So uh, welcome to all of you. And indeed, uh, the many board members who have served and continue to serve for a second term uh, that uh, continue to provide the service uh, through uh, a very important uh, time of the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Uh, I look forward to continuing to work with each and every one of you, uh, learning from your expertise, uh, your commitment to Nova Scotians, uh, and as Frank said earlier, to the patients of Nova Scotia. We know that Nova Scotians expect a lot from our healthcare system, and that's the way it should be. What we don't always take the time to realize as patients and individual citizens is the role of the many people uh, behind the organization uh, to make the system what it is. From the volunteers that work on our, our board of directors to provide oversight and, and governance to the organization, to the frontline workers, the policy makers, the researchers, We've seen much of that uh, work here on the floor with these poster presentations. Uh, I, unfortunately, Frank, uh, did not get to see all of them. I got stopped at the first one and was engaged in some conversation there uh, and didn't get out to see the other, other posters. Um, but we have many uh, researchers, educators, as well as uh, an immense uh, volunteer uh, group. I know I've seen uh, um, Joe McDonald, I saw uh, Bean, uh, Bill Bean, we're somewhere here this, earlier today, individuals who work with our foundations, uh, so critical uh, to the support of our healthcare system in communities across uh, the province. Um, and we know we expect a lot from our healthcare providers and these volunteers and, and uh, employees, but what you may not realize is that they expect even more from themselves on, on many, time, uh, many occasions. So our healthcare system is full of passionate and dedicated people. I'm very proud of that, and I want to make sure that they are aware uh, of, uh, of that recognition for the work that they do uh, every day. There's been a lot of work, an amazing amount of work done over the past year in the Nova Scotia Health Authority, and I just uh, have a couple of, uh, of examples of things that have happened in our healthcare system uh, because of the individuals that make up the system. They've continued to make progress on collaborative practices, establishing new and expanding existing family practices, collaborative family practices. Uh, we now have about 50 uh, across the province in various stages of development and expansion. Uh, we've reduced home support wait lists in the province by 83% since 2015. We've reduced long-term care wait lists by 56% since 2015. Work continues and is ongoing to actively recruit and retain physicians throughout the province. A once in a generation project, the redevelopment of the QE2 Health Sciences Center. 
There's the announcement and the implementation of a new palliative care center at St. Martha's Regional Hospital. There's been increased access to the life-saving naloxone drug, uh, which helps in uh, instances of opioid uh, overdose. And most recently, announcements of very important work coming to Cape Breton to better connect patients and their families to the care they need within their community for years to come. So everyone who's worked and contributed and supported the Nova Scotia Health Authority over the past year, and indeed since its inception in 2015, you should be very proud of the progress you've made. On behalf of the Department of Health and Wellness and the province of Nova Scotia, I want to thank the board members, the executive, as well as every physician and employee, no matter what role you play within the organization. Your work makes a difference in the lives of Nova Scotians when they need it the most. I look forward to working with you in the year ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister DeLore. Uh, now it's my, uh, my great pleasure to introduce someone who I uh, have become fast friends with in my three months uh, and a few days as chair of the, uh, of the Health Authority, uh, the President and CEO of the Nova Scotia Health Authority, Janet Knox. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to see so many people here. Nova Scotia Health Authority values innovation. You've seen some wonder, wonderful examples here this afternoon, and we see it in our organization every day. I want to thank all of our poster presenters here today and their teams for their focused efforts to really improve patient care, to improve the patient experience, to be very focused on quality and safety and health outcomes for individuals, families, and indeed communities that we serve and for sharing your stories. It's very important. There are some tough challenges in the health system. Access to primary health care, emergency department closures, we have wait times that are not where we want them to be, and hospital overcrowding to name but a few. Solutions to these challenges require new ideas and new approaches. The transformation underway in our primary health care system is just one example. We know how important it is for people to have access to a primary care provider. This has and will continue to be a priority for us as an organization. We are investing in family practice teams while we continue to recruit family doctors. This year we are working with 23 additional teams to add 39 more health professionals in communities across the province. And we're increasing our focus on wellness and chronic disease management and indeed prevention of chronic disease. We're so proud of the teams at the Weymouth Medical Center at Hans Health and Wellness and our Integrated Chronic Care Service who recently received the National 3M Health Quality Award for group medical visits. Our collective goal is to improve care, to improve access, and indeed to support improved health for all Nova Scotians. Innovation helps us recruit and retain the very best talent. You've heard a lot about physician recruitment this year. We have developed a comprehensive recruitment strategy, created a provincial advisory committee, and worked with our partners to create more training opportunities for residents, a new practice-ready assessment program for physicians that are trained outside of Canada. We are also increasing community and physician involvement, enhancing practice supports for candidates and newly recruited physicians, and building on our local, national, and international recruitment efforts. And we're starting to see the results of our recruiting trips across this country, and particularly to the United Kingdom, with a significant increase in the last two months of site visits, particularly of family physicians. Physicians that sign on to work here note the opportunities to work with a highly skilled community of physicians and applaud the many opportunities to teach and to research. This past year, 103 doctors started practice in our province, and another 53 by the end of the year were committed to, be, to, to come. Innovation also helps us be better as we plan, implement, and evaluate new approaches to care and service delivery. This is evident in our multi-year action plan to reduce wait lists and achieve the national benchmark 
for hip and knee surgeries by 2020. Our strategy places a greater focus on wellness and is helping more patients receive the care they need sooner. So last year, there were 4.6% fewer patients waiting at the end of the year than at the beginning. We are pleased today, I can tell you today, that we have recently finalized the recruitment of four additional orthopedic surgeons. The first of these surgeons joined our team at Valley Regional Hospital in April, and the remaining three will join teams at Dartmouth General, Halifax Infirmary, and the Aberdeen Hospital in the fall. Two of our new recruits have experienced delivering the same day hip and knee surgery, which is approach that we are keen to explore for otherwise healthy patients. This will help improve care and allow more surgeries to take place. So innovating to serve people better. Innovation is reflected in our efforts to promote positive mental health care and support in Nova Scotia. Our team is focused on improving experience of patients and their families while helping to support their road to wellness and recovery. This year we expanded community-based programs for children and youth, including the Schools Plus program and Caper Base, and have a number of other initiatives underway to improve access and make it easier for people to navigate the mental health system. And it's seen in our efforts to support people to live safely at home as long as possible. As you've heard from the minister, we've made some significant gains in wait times for both home care and long-term care. Innovation also creates opportunities. With more than 1,200 active research projects underway in this organization, we really are a hub of cutting-edge scientific research, learning, and discovery. Researchers here in our province are working to improve health and care delivery now and for the future. They are championing advances in therapy and new approaches to care. I encourage you to review the Research Services Annual Report for many wonderful examples of this work. When we talk about innovation, we often think about technology. And we are using technology to bring patients and care providers together in virtual consultations, give faster access to results at the bedside with point of care testing, and train doctors and nurses using virtual reality. And there are many great examples of how we are working differently with communities. Earlier, we heard the inspiring story about efforts to support COPD patients and their families in their homes. We are also working with schools to support the health of children and youth and with municipalities and fitness facilities to provide opportunities for frail seniors to exercise safely. And I hope you saw the program over there about reducing ice, social isolation with the walk and roll program. So you've seen many other examples in the posters presentation shared here today and you can read about these and others in our annual report. We have challenges ahead of us. An aging population, high rates of chronic disease, recruitment challenges, and aging infrastructure, to name some. Just putting more money into our system is not going to solve these problems. We need new and better ways of care and service delivery, one that reflects advances in technology, best practices, and most importantly, is, that is responsive to the needs of our population today and into the future. And we can only do that by working together. Our physicians, employees, learners, researchers, volunteers, and our many partners, including our community health boards, our foundations, and auxiliaries play a key role. And we value and appreciate the contributions they make every single day. So too do all Nova Scotians. The individuals, families, and communities we serve have an important perspective. And we are committed to listening and learning as we build a stronger, more responsive system together. This year, we've talked with Nova Scotians about family practice teams and cancer, cancer services. And we now have more than 135 patient family advisors who are lending their voice to improvement activities and service planning across our province. We are continuing to build on this approach. We are focused on building a safe, high-quality health system that serves Nova Scotians every day to be healthy and stay healthy. That is what we need. Today we celebrate that spirit of learning, discovery and innovation as we continue to work differently for a healthier future for our citizens. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Janet. I'd like to make a few remarks <clears throat> at this point. Um, and I'm going to start with the, uh, the proclamation, if you will, that we are at an indisputable inflection point in, uh, in our life as the NSHA organization. As we all move forward in transforming the Nova Scotia health system, we need to reflect certainly on the progress that we've made, but we also need to reflect and take action on the areas where we can improve. And as we do, and as we do that, we build on the shoulders of those who set the framework for this needed transformation that started three years ago with the beginning of a province-wide health authority. Maybe not always appreciated, but that was enormously heavy lifting to get done, to go from nine health authority, district health authorities to one provincial health authority. Uh, not an easy job. I started as board chair three months ago, and since that time I've traveled the province. I wanted to see it firsthand and get a feel for things. I visited 28 facilities, uh, seven of the nine regional hospitals, and had an absolutely wonderful tour and full morning at the Dixon Cancer Center of the QE2. Phenomenal, world-class work going on, that, going on at that center. I've met with more than 60 healthcare leaders in the system. I wrote this probably a week ago. It's probably up to 80 now, uh, healthcare uh, leaders within the system. Municipal and provincial leaders, leaders in the health care organizations, including foundations, community health boards, uh, auxiliaries, frontline workers, physicians, surgeons who were happy, surgeons who weren't happy, uh, health care advocates, and I met with everyone whether they supported everything that the Nova Scotia Health Authority was doing or whether they didn't support what the Nova Scotia Health Care. Uh, uh, Nova, Nova Scotia Health Authority was doing. These groups that I've just described with genuine constructive interest and insight in the development of health care will all have something to add to the debate as we continue forward as the Nova Scotia Health Authority. We are transitioning from a care model, from a, a historical care model to a modern integrated and a more technical one, a more demanding one to execute. And that's not easy or simple work. Here's the good news. The good news is that the Nova Scotia Health System leadership is tackling the transition in an evidence-based way, we're not winging it, in an evidence-based way with the leadership and support of our government. There is alignment. We fully appreciate the change is hard, the change that comes with that is hard. Even if it is the right course to take, it creates uncertainty, it creates concern, and at times it creates a feeling of being left out. In simple terms, the inflection point I referred to a few moments ago is to take the work of the past three years, the setting up of the authority, and now deliver excellent access to care and better health outcomes for Nova Scotians. Or in simple terms, it's about executing and getting results. That is our focus. And it's a focus across the whole system. I refer to alignment. The government, the Department of Health and Wellness, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, the doc, uh, Doctors Nova Scotia, our physicians across the province, all of our healthcare workers and allied healthcare workers in the system, our unions, we're all part of it with the NSHA to deliver results for our patients in Nova Scotia. As I, uh, as I like to tell folks who ask me what this job is like and what my impressions are after the first three months, I tell them there is no finish line when it comes to healthcare. Whether you're in Nova Scotia or any other part of the world, there will be continued change in health care. There has to be continued change in health care because technology evolves, delivery of care evolves, our knowledge evolves. Um, there is no finish line, and that's how we have to think about it. So as chair of the board, what do I see ahead for us? Uh, the first is transparency. 
I've heard a lot about transparency since beginning this role. We have to bring those who are impacted by this trans transformation, we have to bring them along the way in partnership and in an informed, deliberate way. Public trust depends on transparency and it's public trust that's at stake. Greater transparency will start with me and my colleagues around the board table. Tomorrow the board will review, debate, and vote on a resolution for a two-phased approach that starts at our next meeting in September with the posting of board highlights followed by our meeting, uh, board highlights that follow our meeting. And we will provide time to listen to established groups such as foundations and auxiliaries and community health boards who will be able to present to the board their views so that the board can take those into consideration while we're meeting in their area. Phase two, we will move to an open board meeting format, not dissimilar to the IWK, for four meetings a year. This, will, this work to prepare for that open meeting concept will take a bit of time, it will be done over the next few months with full implementation by the start of the new fiscal year, 2019-2020. Uh, the second area of focus uh, for the board and, and me as chair is engagement. Given the importance of engagement, we will continue to strengthen the engagement with all our stakeholders, internal and external. It's very clear to us that initiatives such as the Cape Breton Redevelopment Investment, which was referred to earlier, present perfect opportunities to up our game on engagement across the province, and you will see us do that. Fortunately, we're not starting from the beginning. We have recruited over 135 patient and family advisors who are now lending their voice to improvement activities and service planning activities across the province. And we're hosting community conversations with Nova Scotians on collaborative family practice teams to learn what communities feel we need to know to support these teams to be successful in Nova Scotia. I don't need to emphasize how important primary care is. It is the gateway to the health system. So far, 20 community conversations relating to collaborative care have been held with 548 Nova Scotians and over 50 people have participated online. All of these conversations provide value and inform our planning going forward on how to improve access to care. It's perhaps our biggest challenge. I'm always reluctant to say that because there are lots of challenges, but is it one of our significant challenges. This is a priority for me and the board, and the board agenda will dedicate sufficient time to this opportunity. Uh, we understand. We understand there remains significant work ahead and we're committed to creating a system that Nova Scotians from Yarmouth to Cape North help inform by telling us their needs and we will listen. Again, we do have a start. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm an alumnus of the Cape Breton Regional Hospital Foundation and I'm proud of that because it, it was my gateway to get involved in the healthcare system in Nova Scotia. We have 41 foundations and 33 auxiliaries that fuel many positive stories as they provide support to our patient care and programs and services. I can't say enough about foundations uh, given my own experience with the one in Cape Breton, but also just how significantly important foundations are, not just for the money, but because they are the gateway to communities to help us understand what we can do better and to partner to bring new technology and other uh, good uses of the donations to the, uh, to the facilities in our communities. For example, a good one is in early June, a new palliative care unit opened up at St. Martha's Regional Hospital in Antigonish. You can take a virtual tour, by the way, of that unit through our online annual report. The St. Martha's Regional Hospital Foundation committed $600,000 to that project and the St. Martha's Regional Hospital Auxiliary contributed another 150,000 for furnishings and equipment. Also in June, we celebrated the opening of a new state-of-the-art digital x-ray suite at the Queen's General Hospital, which was fully funded, over half a million dollars by the hospital's foundation. 
And there are countless other examples of how foundations and auxiliaries are supporting health care in our communities across Nova Scotia. Our 37 community health boards are another vital partner in our work to achieve healthy people, healthy communities for generations, our mission. Community health boards listen to and work with communities to identify health needs related primarily to the social determinants of health, education, income, transportation, a sense of belonging. Think about those things. They all contribute to what kind of health state we have. These needs are reflected in the community health plans developed by the community health boards and in the work they do with community partners to promote health and wellness. But I have to say, and I've, I've met with a number of the community health boards, this is just a start. I think we can do better in terms of engaging community health boards, but we've got a, a good running start to do that. I also want to recognize the more than 23,000 employees, 3,200 physicians, 7,000 volunteers, who work and support the NSHA. We are nothing without frontline health care talent, and we can never forget that. These individuals bring the best of themselves to work every day for the sake of patients, the patients' families, clients, and our community. They provide compassion. They provide compassion at times of great vulnerability and they do their work knowing it is contributing to something far bigger than themselves. And on behalf of the board, we thank you. Finally, all members of our health care team have a role in strengthening the public trust in the health system. What we do every day matters so much for building that public trust. All of us are responsible for bringing forward constructive, informed, and insightful criticism and for shining a light also on the significant progress of the health system. Let's be straight with each other. This is our collective story to shape, and it's our collective story to tell. We look forward to creating it together. Thank you. The Nova Scotia Health Authority's Board of Directors is made up of 14 experienced professionals from across the province. And it really has been my honour to, uh, to meet these people and to begin to work with them. An absolutely first-class group of people. These volunteer directors were appointed by the Minister of Health and Wellness. They attend 30 meetings a year, plus minus, each of which requires significant preparation and, for many, regular travel. I'm getting to know the highway between Sydney and Halifax pretty darn well at this point. In addition to the meetings in Halifax, the board has held meetings and community gatherings in Sydney, Kentville, Truro, Bridgewater, Dartmouth, Amherst, Antigonish, and Yarmouth. In the 2017-18 fiscal year, we had four members, as was mentioned earlier, retire from the board, and we're very grateful to them. David Dow, Anna Stewart, John Young, and outgoing chair Steve Parker. Steve was here, uh, he had an other engagement and another commitment, so he had to leave, but uh, in his absence, I hope all of you tell him when you see him how grateful I am for the uh, guidance and the support he gave me through the transition. Uh, he was just terrific. Each of these members provided a significant contribution to the governance of Nova Scotia Health Authority and their presence on the board is missed. I joined the board, as I said, as chair on April 1, 2018, along with four new members. Detailed bios of each of our members have been included in today's meeting package, and they can also be found on the website. I'd encourage you, if you haven't been to the website, to go there. We put a lot of stuff on that website. I will ask each member now to stand as their name is called. Please, uh, please hold your applause to the end. Um, famous in Cape Breton is George Unsworth, who serves as Vice Chair of the Board and Chair of the Governance Committee. He also sits on the Finance and Audit Committee. Colin Kopp is Chair of the Human Resources Committee and a member of the Public Engagement Committee. 
Diane Hamilton, who could not be with us today, is Vice Chair of the Finance and Audit Committee and a member of the Quality Improvement and Safety Committee. Vicki Harnish is Chair of the Finance and Audit Committee and a member of the Health Services Committee. Wayne McDonald is on the Quality Improvement and Safety Committee and Governance Committee. Marie McCulley Collier is the Vice Chair of the Quality Improvement and Safety Committee and a member of the Public Engagement Committee. John Rogers is Chair of the Health Services Committee and a member of the Human Resources Committee. Doug Shatford is a member of the Finance and Audit Committee and a member of the Governance Committee. Jamie Smith is Chair of the Public Engagement Committee and a member of the Governance Committee. And I'm pleased to introduce our newest members. Dr. Louise Cloutier is Chair of the Quality Improvement and Safety Committee and a member of the Health Services Committee. And I would really encourage you, if you haven't done it, to look at, at the profiles online. These are impressive backgrounds with the people I'm introducing. David, Gra David Graham is a member of the Governance Committee and the Human Resources Committee. Dr. Patty Hanson Ketchum is a member of the Quality Improvement and Safety Committee and the Human Resources Committee. Dr. Cindy Forbes is a non-voting member of the board and sits on the Health Services Committee and the Public Engagement Committee. And Janet Knox, who you met earlier, is President and Chief Executive Officer of the NSHA. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the Board of Directors of the Nova Scotia Health Authority, a completely volunteer board at your service. So in your packages, you will find a summary page of our annual report, along with summary reports from each of the board committees. You can find a more detailed version of our annual report on our website. I now call upon the committee chairs to provide a brief report on their committee's activities over the past year. Leading us off will be George Unsworth. I was involved with the foundation in Cape Britain long before Frank comes. So, and this, <laughs> this is our tie. <laughs> governance Committee. The Governance Committee makes recommendations and provides oversight in the area of governance policy and procedures, membership, board effectiveness, leadership, and board education and development. In 2017-2018, the Governance Committee provided an annual board education plan, assisted the board with preparation of the on-site Accreditation Canada survey, and achieved 100% compliance with the government standards. Com the committee continues to monitor and review governance best practices. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Colin Kopp. I'm the uh, chair of the HR committee. The Human, Re Human Resources Committee provides governance and oversight in relation to the current and future human resources needs. Compensation and employee relations matters, as well as the president and CEO's plan for continuity and development of senior management. In 2017 through 18, the committee provided oversight and monitored the strategic human resources performance indicators compliance with human resources legislation and policy, employee and labor relations, including collective bargaining and essential services planning, and the people and organizational development plan. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Louise Cloutier. I'm Chair of the Quality Improvement and Safety Committee. The committee provides governance oversight to quality of care and service, safety and system performance. This includes aspects of uh, strategic plans, corporate performance, stakeholder relations and communications. These all support quality improvement and safety priorities. Throughout the 2017-2018, the committee monitored the achievement of organizational goals, objectives and priorities, and the requirements of the accountability agreement be between the Department of Health and Wellness and the NSHA. In addition, 
the committee monitored our performance indicators and reported to the board on our progress. Thank you. Good afternoon, I am Jamie Smith, the Chair of the Public Engagement Committee. The Public Engagement Committee supports the Board in fulfilling its legislated role for the integration of public engagement into health services planning and delivery, and the inclusion of community, patient, family, and stakeholder voices in the strategy and direction of the organization. In 2017-18, the committee oversaw strategic relationships and partnerships with community, government, and other stakeholders across the system, supported the engagement of patients and families in the delivery of health services, and ensured the implementation of engagement strategies and activities within various areas of the system, including primary health care and cancer care. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm John Rogers. I'm the chair of the Health Services Planning Committee. That committee provides governance oversight uh, to the planning, prioritization, and implementation of health services, including engagement with stakeholders. Throughout 2017 and 18, the committee reviewed proposed care models, service models, and implement implementation plans to understand their alignment with priority issues relating to quality, safety, population health, human resources, engagement, and sustainability. In addition, the committee monitored implementation of approved planning activities, including primary health care collaboration practice teams and enhancements to community-based mental health and addiction services and the orthopedic surgery strategy. Thank you. I'd now like to call upon Vicki Harnish to say a few words about a very important committee, um, and she'll say a few words on behalf of the Finance and Audit Committee. Thank you, Frank, and good afternoon. And just so you know, this is everyone's favorite committee to sit on. <laughs> um, so I have the pleasure of uh, serving as Chair of Finance and Audit Committee. And it's my task today to provide some comments on the financial statements of the Nova Scotia Health Authority for the year ended March 31, 2018. And just a few of our highlights. The Nova Scotia Health Authority ended the year in a balanced budget position for the third consecutive year. It took a lot of hard work and diligence by NSHA leadership and in managing their resources, as well as some additional funding support from the Department of Health and Wellness uh, to cover quite a spike in service demand throughout the year, particularly the last quarter. Uh, management of the Health Authority has provided their assurance, the statements are fairly stated, and our auditors, the Auditor General of Nova Scotia, has given a clean, unqualified opinion on the statements. The Office of the Auditor General has also indicated they're pleased with management's actions and responses in addressing prior year audit findings. And there are no significant control deficiencies reported in this year's audit. The statements have been approved by the board and presented to the government for consolidation in the overall provincial results. The Board has appointed the Office of the Auditor General as Auditors for Nova Scotia Health Authority for 2018-2019. And I'd like to thank all the people responsible for preparing and auditing the financial statements. We know it was quite a task. Uh, our financials are posted online under the Health Authority website, nshhealth.ca slash annual report 1718. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vicki. That completes the um, formal part of the, the program, if you will. We're now going to open uh, the floor for uh, Q&A, for questions and answers. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and someone will come to you with a microphone and uh, you'll be able to answer, uh, you'll be able to ask your question. 
that. There's one over here. And you can direct the questions to either Janet or I. Uh, if, if it's not suitable for us to answer, we'll refer it, and also to Minister Delory. Uh, thank you. My name is Barbara Adams, and I'm, the, I'm a physiotherapist, but the MLA for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. And I'm not 100% sure, but I might have asked the same question last year. So um, you were talking about um, uh, the, the purpose of having things open for the communities to have a better understanding. Uh, Minister DeLore referenced the cut in wait times to long-term care. And as a physiotherapist who worked in home care for a long time, it isn't my impression that the wait times have gotten any better for the people that I know who are living in the communities waiting for those beds. Um, what happened is they changed the requirements for who could go on the wait list. And I had quite a number of people who called continuing care to be assessed and they deemed that they weren't eligible to go on the wait list for one reason or another. So I'm guessing what I, or I guess my question is, can you clarify for me when you say you cut the wait times, does that mean people are actually getting into long-term care faster or that there are fewer number of people on the list because we change the requirements for who gets on the list? Thank you for that question. So it's probably a combination of several factors. One of the things that we would have learned early on uh, was that there were people on a wait list for long-term care who really had no intention of going at the time. So working with long-term care facilities, the, the process of determining when you're, when you're on a list means you're eligible to be placed. And also working uh, with uh, some of the long-term care, the sector, in terms of turnaround times, uh, in terms of how long it takes to actually get somebody to, to be able to move into a facility. So it was a whole process review in terms of looking at the whole process of when you're identified, it's deemed to be you require a long-term uh, care uh, residence, and what's the process to get you there, which also includes working with the sector. So it was a it was a whole process improvement, and indeed, we have reduced the wait times for once you're eligible for long-term care, the wait times to get there. Further questions? Well, that was easy. <laughs> um, a question back here. Oh, is there one back here? Great. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pamela McGee, and I'm the uh, Executive Director of the Canadian Mental Health Association, Nova Scotia Division. And my question is in relation to patient access and monitoring. So what are the outcomes showing in relation to patient care and outcomes in the area of mental health and addictions? I think I'll have to ask, I, I don't think I heard the end of your question. So there's a committee that um, monitors quality of care and service, and it's in relation to the outcomes uh, for patient outcomes and access to care and outcomes after they receive the care in relation to mental health and addiction support in Nova Scotia. I, I still didn't get the, I'm sorry. I'm what is the data showing? Oh. So the quality improvement data. So uh, I, I, can't, I can't tell you all of that. Uh, I can't itemize that for you right now what I, because I'm not really sure exactly what you're asking of me. Well, so what I can say to you is one of the things, so you, you mentioned access. So one of the issues that we, we are focusing on is how do we make sure that people have access in their community to the care that they need? And so one of the things that we are working on in the current year, we began last year with, with funding support from the Department of Health and Wellness and it'll be completed this year, is one central intake so that people have one place to call and then they can be, they can be uh, triaged to the best uh, service. Measuring access then, we look at measuring access to um, uh, um, who needs urgent service and what's the timeline in which uh, they need that, and the timeline is seven days is the, is the target that we have. So we are measuring that now and can tell uh, 
in, and by August of this year, that information will be available uh, for everybody to see because we will have determined what are the standardized measure me, wait times, what's the standardized way to measure that, and that will be all available. I think that's what you're asking. Are we really providing access, and do we know that we're doing that? So thank you very much for your question. It's really important to be able to s help people understand the services available to them in the time that we think is appropriate, given the evidence across the country, and monitoring that to make sure where we need to make uh, investments. We've been very fortunate that in the last uh, two years that we've made constant investment in community-based support with, uh, with new investments, financial investments from the government. So it is a really important issue, mental health support for the people of the province. Thank you for the question. We have one more here. My name is Pauline Liam, and I come from Anaganish. Um, my question is about doctors and the provision of the same. Well, I know there are going to be 10 new residences coming in, in the near future to our hospitals, and that's very great news. But what provisions, if any, are being given to help other students, the one years one to four, who are already in medical school at the moment, to help them to think about staying here in this province? I understand in other provinces that incentives are given, like they're bought stethoscopes or they're given a loan, things like that. Do we do anything like that? And if we don't, why not? So, so you're speaking right to the heart of the issue. We want the people who are educated here to, to know that they're welcome and that we want them. And so uh, with, uh, with the Faculty of Medicine and also with our uh, partners, at, uh, the Department of Health and Wellness, we are looking at all incentives across the lifespan of educating health professionals. So it is something that is very important we're looking at. So what I can tell you, at this uh, moment in time, we make sure we meet those uh, new uh, students and help them understand that we really want to follow them through their career. Uh, and as the new residents come out, we make sure we connect with them. So I can tell you that Dr. Harrigan just spent time with the new residents at uh, Dalhousie uh, as in their first week of becoming brand new first year residents uh, and talk about the future here and, and the, how we value them. Uh, so there's many, uh, and, and Dr. Harrigan is in the audience, so she can tell you, uh, you can talk to her after putting you on the spot, Lynn. Uh, but it's a very important thing that you're raising. And we need, as a province, to share with our young people that we want them to be here and we want to find ways for them to stay. And so as we approach recruitment, helping our, our young professionals, doctors, nurses, and others uh, to travel the province and see what opportunities are available for them, it's up to us to create the place that they want to be. So thank you for raising that. It's very important. Uh, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to suggest that you look at what's being done in Yarmouth County and has been done in the recruitment of physicians in the French-speaking community. They're light years ahead of us. They've done an extraordinary job of supporting their summers through uh, their medical students through summer employment and also providing uh, experiences there. I'm sure you're aware of that, and it's something that we as community people could do uh, but I do think we need some assistance from the center for that as well. Thank you. Thank you for that suggestion. So we'll close the Q&A. Um, as we include or conclude our 2017-2018, I'll slow down, annual general meeting, uh, I want to thank you all for sharing your time with us, uh, whether you joined online or in person. I'm pleased to see the size of the crowd. Thank you for your interest, and thank you for your commitment to, uh, to achieving a healthier Nova Scotia.